Well, we had three really interesting presentations. We had a difference between a discussion of the difference between mental health and behavioral health. We had an introduction to the concept of cognitive burden. And then we just had a really interesting presentation on cognitive burden and uh, as it relates to burden of illness and burden of treatment. Um, I'd like to thank all of the presenters for their presentations. I'll open the floor up for uh, questions. Round table, table members first, if you would hold up your um, cards and when I call on you, if you would give me your name, give us your name and your affiliation, that would be great. You left him speechless. You gave him cognitive burden. <laughs> Michael. Okay. So, um, okay, Mike, I, um, I'm going to channel Rima. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, the little tomatoes. I'm not sure what you're talking about um, when you, when, the way you use the term um, uh, universal precautions. I think we're not using it in the same way. Um, to identify someone who's having trouble uh, understanding is actually a fantastic way to identify the core top target audience that you're talking about. So if you, universal precautions is not one uh, uh, tool, one method. It's actually a, a whole approach to say who's actually struggling to succeed in our care context. And then by finding those people, you have to identify what the interventions are going to be needed to be, and then you identify the sub-phenotypes. I wouldn't have this problem if ever actually people were identifying the patients with MCI and identifying the patients with substance abuse and identifying the patients with, uh, with behavioral health issues. But the thing is, we don't. We have so many people missing, are not identified. So, like, you know, it's just, I'm not sure what the, I don't, I'm not sure what the beef is. So... Agreed. I don't, I don't think it's so much. I think part of the issue is I don't think universal precautions have been, even in the ARC, I was looking at the ARC Health Literacy Toolkit. Um, I think how it has been played out um, has been variable. And I do think that asking much to, I would kind of argue, uh, the presentation before me, Dr. Steffens, I mean, I think is there a mechanism currently, like to your point, like because there are so many, um, uh, there are so many missed cases of other things that could be contributing to why someone um, didn't understand the question or couldn't effectively teach back. I think um, without a process in place where we can do a better job of really kind of characterizing what the nature of the issue is, um, we may lead to a more superficial remediation of the patient until you really understand it. Because again, if, if someone is going years with subtle cognitive decline and you're not picking that up and you're thinking that you know better patient information or, or communication is going to deal with it, I think that's where these cases get missed. And and that's where I think there needs to be this kind of where I'm moving towards this this idea that we really do need to kind of better phenotype who these patients are because then you might be able to find a better strategy in play. I don't think... I think the, the issue is more in the case finding and the characterization of the case finding and the, the kind of having a very well detailed mapping of what to do about it. I um, mean, I think that's where healthcare systems have moved to. I, you're right, I probably did make more of a amount of a mohel and to say that uh, not to throw universal precautions on the, on the fire, but I think it, maybe it could be moved forward even further in the third edition in terms of how you can actually really provide a more um, operational kind of... Uh, triage. Cindy. Um, I'm Cindy Brock with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. I'm a recovering roundtable member. Um, and I think Michael was actually channeling me, not Rima. I think Rima would be talking about the literacy issues and not to let um, those uh, the cognitive issues swamp the the issues around literacy, but I now am liberated to and we'll we'll have a, a remedial session later about the 
the um, span of health literacy very much encompassing system level changes and quality improvement and, and we read together the 10 attributes of a health literate organization. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, IDing vulnerable patients so we can spend more time with them um, because I think everybody agrees, I mean most people would like you know, everybody would like more time on the provider and on the patient side, but that indeed there are some patients who do need more time. Um, any thoughts as to, you know, what the algorithms might look like for identifying those patients so that you can actually schedule that time ahead, of, you know, in advance? So um, our, our General Internal Medicine and Geriatrics Division just has been dealing with this because we've been making a big push to, um, it's a great question, um, and I'm happy that you're liberated. <laughs> uh, the, uh, we've been spending a lot of time on how do you, um, you know, what factors to kind of go into that algorithm that would determine when someone's scheduled next that you think of a larger block of time. And, and this is more in the case of the fact that we, like many primary care um, uh, divisions, I'm on the research side of it, um, have on average the mean age is no longer, it's, it's a mean age of around 64 in, in growing, so it's becoming more of a geriatric practice. And so um, how do you kind of accommodate it? And some has been even looking at, you know, how do you pull up the quantified of how much time was spent at the last visit? Um, should that help determine going into the next visit? If you ended up spending, you blocked for 15 or 20 minutes and you ended up spending 30, um, then maybe that could be factored into it. Could you also look into issues around um, uh, the, you know, kind of their multimorbidity, the multimorbidity? Um, Within our division and many of our quality um, group have been trying to factor in um, what specific EHR level data could be used to kind of quantify a score that puts someone into it. Um, factors around health literacy or, uh, or issues around suspected cognitive impairment, we're just now rolling out into our practice um, and we're going to be doing it over the next two years, how we can start doing a two-step uh, two cognitive um, uh, detection protocol where the first one, which qualifies for CMS, by the way, is just asking two simple questions that have been validated on a subjective complaint. So having a funnel, so if there's a proxy of a, of a cognitive concern identified by uh, a loved one or caregiver, by the patient themselves, suspected by the clinician, or that through proactively asking two simple questions that go along with the wellness visit that those things can start to document and that would also funnel into maybe starting to recognize that you need more than 15 minutes for this patient moving forward. And my guess is that a lot of patients that, you know, if you gave them a health literacy screen, it would kick into it. I guess I would also hope that we could expand that to thinking about um, more broadly populations of people with uh, chronic persistent mental illness where, um, as I mentioned, you know, ex issues of executive dysfunction are um, pretty common and prominent in, in, in some cases. So it's almost one can make an assumption that in certain areas that there will be problems. H having said that, it'd be nice to move beyond just making assumptions. And I think this is, you know, I'm geriatric psychiatrist, so I'm all over everything that, that, that Michael just said. I wonder, though, more broadly in the field whether uh, we can be informed by what we know from cognitively impaired older populations and apply that to, um, to younger populations uh, with, um, with mental illness. Um, this is, I think, an understudied and under-equipped area and one that I would encourage uh, the roundtable to, to, to continue to think about because it's, you know, we want to be able to, to detect these, we want uh, issues, and then hopefully design interventions that will actually help people take more ownership of their, of their healthcare decision making. Um, and, and I think, again, this is just a very much an, uh, an understudied area in, in mental illness. Just one of that, as I was listening to this, I, I, I was thinking, well, I, s some of this requires additional research and additional cl clinical trials of one form or another. So wh where might those be supported? I, I would think that CMS might be a very l likely source within their innovation center, particularly as you're, the age of your population is heading north of 64. 
uh, and uh, PCORI might be another source, uh, certainly AHRQ. This is not typically an area where NIH is a, a major player, but, but I think there might be specific questions in terms of the underlying mechanism. Yeah, I think really NIDA ought to think about that. <laughs> I know. It's like, hello. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to. HHS is a very broad department, <laughs> and uh, uh, we speak for all of our partners that have resources that can help improve the quality of care. That was very interesting. Terry. So I want to ask all three of you about uh, technology. It seems like sometimes many federal agencies think technology is the fix, the low cost fix. But if one in five are dropping through the cracks and we're not adequately servicing them, I, people, many people want trust and solid relationships. You heard that this morning. And then with telehealth, I'm very interested in rural health. Does that work for depression, counseling, addictive disease, or substance use disorder? I get the right term now. Um, does tele medicine to help with that? And is there, I mean, you can't have an app for everything. A lot of those people are not happy, you know? <laughs> so I, I guess I can speak a bit. So there's, there is, um, I think, a growing consensus that, that telepsychiatry, telemental health um, can be helpful. Um, there are, uh, uh, the, actually, one of the innovators in this is, uh, is the VA. And because they have to reach out to uh, to, uh, to to rural uh, to rural areas as well, and I know um, uh, at the uh, at the VA, at VA Connecticut at a, at a West Haven, this is a this is a major area of focus. So they do tele tele pain management, tele uh, tele CBT for a variety of illnesses. Um, uh, they do suboxone prescribing via via telehealth. So I, I would say that this is. Outside, uh, outside of the VA, there, there are also lots of demonstration projects, Project Echo, things like that, where telepsychiatry does seem to be, there, there's a growing evidence base that it's helpful, but I think one under-recognized area is within the VA system. Yeah. Uh. We, we love technology, um, as you said, but I think that, that it, Keeping in mind the limitations and the lack of applicability to really important subsegments of the population, I would encourage us to focus on a population perspective. So, are we really impacting a large enough group that it's it's worth investing in in these sometimes complex uh, 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 technologies to to apply across broad areas? Even when we think about tele telehealth, we're, we're all very engaged in, can it be used for buprenorphine treatment? The VA has figured out how to do it, but there are a lot of regulatory issues beyond sort of the practical issues. You have to do a physical exam of the patient you're taking care of. I kind of can't do that over the telephone. So am, am, if, if I'm the person on the far end, am I the person who has them in my practice as a buprenorphine patient? Or might it be that I could serve as a consultant to a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant who would be the on-ground person that these are some of the thorny details that have to be worked out just for that one technology, let alone apps for self-care and, and other places. Or we're looking at the use of, of detection methodologies in terms of wristbands or others to look at drug exposures. I'd love to know when my patients are drinking or smoking cigarettes or using substances. And that might be, th those are some of the technologies that are at least being considered as a way to learn more about the day-to-day -day variation in behaviors. And just to add that, I mean, I think the, the question's broad because the bucket in technology is broad and what you mean for it. So the telehealth, I think, is it just seems increasingly promising, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that, and the, um, and the notion of apps and what, I, I just feel like it's very diverse. I think on a glass half full side, I think where the field of health literacy really could um, like be really ramp up its game more is to recognize that the user interface of these tools really needs that kind of that even more so than it has. I feel it's just starting to really capture 
how you design these things and have evaluation set up to make sure that they aren't driving disparities by literacy because people aren't really understanding the use. The, the Denise Park article, I feel like I keep um, harping on um, here, in other words, you know, where she showed that with her iPad boot camp, taking patients who have uh, cognitive decline, who um, can be shown how to use an iPad through an intensive, intensive, you know, seven week kind of engagement with the, with the device to learn how it can not just engage them on health information, but be socially engaged as well for those who are at risk for isolation. Um, and that it actually showed that using the technology itself could show significant gains on specific aspects of memory and on some of these more fluid kind of learning functions. So I think there's, that's like, but you know, it just means it's a heavy investment for some, for some individuals to, to just understand the new platform if they hadn't used it before. I think, some, I think also some of the really low end kind of like simple, you know, bi-directional text. Um, uh, Michael uh, Pesciolo and I have a project that leverages their interactive voice recognition technology and we haven't shown any disparity by literacy. In fact, we, I would say, have shown incredible uptake because people are really wanting to be more connected to their clinic beyond the point of care because they're not getting what they need during the visit. So that extension is helpful. They'll come to it so long as it's designed well. And I think that's where we're at. We, can we make sure that it's designed well and how do we have proof that it's working? Good discussion, Nicole. Um, thank you to all three of you. This was a really fantastic session. Um, my question's for Dr. Compton with the stigma. Um, with the, I guess, change from substance abuse to substance use disorder and the use of trying to destigmatize the language, is there any preliminary data, and forgive me because I don't know the timeline in terms of when it was rolled out in the DSM, but any preliminary data on uptake and kind of what the effect has been on stigma since we're as... I should say as a field, I'm, by the way, from Tufts School of Dental Medicine, but as a field using um, substance use disorder instead of abuse. Because especially within um, certain fields, um, substance abuse is actually still being used pretty frequently um, with, with patients and in, in healthcare encounters. So. Well, the, 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 the term abuse is kind of in the title of my agency, National Institute on Drug Abuse. So uh, uh, scrubbing the language for potentially stigmatizing words is an ongoing process uh, and won't, won't be done quickly. It's a process change. I would look at work by John Kelly and colleagues to look at any, any recent shifts in how we're using language and whether, what, a, what a difference that's making. Uh, he has, long t he has a large scale survey methodology, which might get at some of the rates of how these are shifting over time. And that's who I would contact. And I, 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 the DSM process itself doesn't include any post hoc right. evaluation other than at some point we will get together and someone will have an idea for some other change and we'll look at the literature to see whether it's supported or not. Um, but there wasn't sort of I any inherent process for evaluating whether that had the desired impact. So we look for outside researchers like John to help us with that. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen? Hi, thank you. Yeah, I'm Ellen Markman from Stanford. I'm in the psychology department and do work on cognitive psychology. And I'd like to follow up on, on that point and on the point that Michael, uh, that Wilson Compton made um, about stigmatizing, stigmatizing language. And I thought the fact that changing it from substance abuse to substance use disorder actually had an effect on the healthcare providers and not just the general public. Um, years ago, I did some research on the power of nominalization to affect people's conceptualization of things. So would ask people, um, suppose you hear, know that John is intellectual, what do you think you know about John? Versus suppose you know that John is an intellectual, what do you think you know about John? And John is an intellectual is much stronger and it elicits people think they know more, they think it's more important to the, that person's identity, it becomes who, who they are in some way more than something about them. And um, I'm struck by how many, um, so anyway, in terms of back to stigma, how many diseases have some potential for, for varying or, or um, diagnoses, varying the kinds of categories. So you can say that um, John has schizophrenia, John is schizophrenic, John is a schizophrenic, 
And those kinds of subtle differences may really affect both how people think about that category and how they think of, and um, how flexible they can be at, at being open to thinking of them in some, some other ways. So I think this is probably a much more general and pervasive kind of issue in, in, in um, thinking about health categories. I'll start. I, I certainly would agree with you. I think the person-centered language is what many of us are aiming for. S some of us need reminders and corrections, um, me included. When I use m m misuse language, I appreciate when people remind me. Um, some of their old habits die hard. Uh, and, and that is what we're talking about, is changing, changing language is part of changing habit for the public as well as professionals. Right. And it does matter. That, that's why it's worth the effort to change, because it does change our automatic responses to the patients that we want to bring the best possible care to. Right. But Let alone the egregious examples of n not even a diagnostic label, but much more horrific adjectives used to describe patients before you, at least as a consultant in a hospital, that was pretty not atypical, unfortunately, that you would hear very unfortunate adjectives to describe people that were completely inappropriate. And helping to shape and change those is, mm -hmm. is a challenge. But one of the ways I, I, I think that was being suggested of thinking about how to change is in addition to what individual people can accomplish in interactions, written material can be scrutinized that becomes then partly reified and useful um, that can be rewritten in ways that are less stigmatizing. I will say that there's not 100% agreement in the addiction policy world. Some would like to increase the stigma that people face as a way of emphasizing the uh, antisocial nature of some of the behaviors. So I get pushback sometimes when we try to change some documents. Yeah, I think that this is... The Go ahead. Okay. Uh, no, just re great point. The um, I think say, saying that somebody is a substance abusing schizophrenic has a very different tone than somebody with uh, a person with sub with schizophrenia who has a substance use disorder. It is a well, uh, and perhaps enough said on that. But um, but from, you know that's the shorthand that was that certainly I grew up with and I and I also struggle and I noticed that even today in my presentation oh yeah I need to make sure that that as I'm referring to this population that I do so correctly I, I hope I did <laughs> Steve if I could St Steve if I could make just add on onto this topic is there's also a, a kind of a literature on stigma in in, health, in literacy and health literacy. And um, so uh, recently completed an R01 with Alyssa Lincoln uh, uh, at Northeastern with uh, patients with severe mental illness. I'm at Boston Medical Center and between the two of our sites, we actually have a significant population of patients with severe mental illness and, and also low health literacy and the kind of the synergistic uh, stigmatizing phenomenon within, within that camp. And actually, the, the primary kind of angle, at least from the literacy side, was not health literacy, was just basic literacy because we had so many people with very, very low basic literacy skills. And so now kind of like, you know, mounting, a, a, a kind of trying to mount an assertive approach towards just adult basic education, like, you know, uh, which is to not typically part of the conversation in the health literacy world per se. It's another whole bucket. But there's kind of a whole... You know, we all need to reread Goffin. We all need to reread kind of the whole background literature out of sociology around stigma, and and bring it. I, I'm actually very optimistic because m almost all the medical students coming up are using SUD. None of them are talking about abuse anymore. Like, there's like a sea change of language that's going to happen. I believe it's going to take an ongoing effort, but I I think that's going to happen. Good. Thank you. Um, Yinka Shinobala at the University of Wisconsin Madison School of Pharmacy. I have a question for Dr. Compton. Thank you for your great presentation, all three of you. Uh, my question is I was kind of fascinated to see that when you talked about the opioid use disorder, that a lot of programs don't have, um, I, I'm not sure if it's an access to treatment problem because of MAT, medication assisted treatment. And so I was just wondering is this an access to medication, natrexone, or is this more of an access to personnel? 
And have you considered, um, I don't know, it neither the possibility of other providers being able to provide MET, like pharmacists, and is it an access issue in terms of personal or an access issue in terms of treatment? Well, the literature would suggest that it's both an issue of the lack of providers and bias against the treatment itself among some of the addiction providers themselves. So uh, th th there are multiple factors that could lead to the lack of, of uh, overall lack of access to care. Uh, certainly when it comes to using other providers to, to bring an effective treatment to the patients that need it, we're open to those research projects. We recently funded a group at Johns Hopkins to do a very small pilot study for pharmacies to dispense methadone. Um, that sounds conceptually pretty straightforward to me. The bureaucratic hurdles in launching that are were unbelievable, were, were very significant. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, required DEA registrations and the approvals for a pilot study with two pharmacies. Um, and so uh, some of it, it, what sounds like a good idea and is used in other countries may require either legislative action to implement in this country or major uh, a shift in the uh, uh, regulatory environment. Did you get it to work eventually? Well, they're in the process. I don't know whether it works, but they're in the, uh, they, at least it's approved they could, they to do it. Yes. And, and to add to that, for um, to be able to give out MAT, which is medication-assisted treatment, you have to be specially trained, and SAMHSA has to approve of you as a provider of that, and many are not interested in pursuing that. Was a major expansion for nurse practitioners and physician assistants just a couple of years ago based on, on, on congressional legislation, but it does require legislation to allow approval for use of the, the uh, substitution treatments, methadone and buprenorphine, because those are themselves can be misused, abused, and so that, that, that's why there's an interest in maintaining controls over them. I would say one other issue that would just have to be put out there is, is reimbursement. If we're talking about um, are these Medicaid patients, are these private patients and differences in reimbursement and uh, unfortunately that those issues come in in terms of whether um, the the types of patients one may one may choose to see and and I think that that's um, that's something that the system has to has to deal with as well good questions and we have time for two short questions so Chris and Jennifer please Chris Desi Bristol Myers Squibb uh, question for Michael uh, does your work point to, suggest, or indicate that the lowest cognitive categories have the poorest outcomes and the highest costs? Or did I miss that? So if you're asking, like, so in the groups when we stratified patients who are cognitively normal versus who had uh, an identified, if even diagnosed, cognitive impairment, um, so this, this, uh, it's a great question. We do have the answer to that. <laughs> so basically, yes. So uh, if you look at individuals who are cognitively impaired, who uh, fall into the low health literacy bucket, they do at bat, they do the worst, and it's a full gradient. If you look at the people who are adequate health literacy with cognitive impairment, their performance and physical and mental health scores, for instance, just as a start, are as good as those with low health literacy who are cognitively normal. It's a full expanse, and it's across every outcome we've seen in LitCog. I'm Jennifer Dillahay with the Arkansas Department of Health. I trained as a geriatrician. And I remember the horror I felt one day when I realized a patient I had seen several times actually had cognitive impairment, and I hadn't picked up on it in the previous appointments. And that also uh, was similar to the horror I felt when I realized that I was seeing patients with low health literacy who were walking out of the um, appointments with me and going out into the waiting room and asking their daughter or son, what did the doctor say? And both of these, to me, um, have something to do with how we design the clinic appointment, our system, um, who they see and interact with besides just the doctor and so forth. And I would be very interested in some of your brief thoughts about how we could better design our system to address these maybe together. 
just to jump in quickly, um, it's a big question, um, and it's something that I feel like uh, I've been spending the past year on this one project within INDS that is just trying to figure out how do you start to do a better job of kind of case finding um, around some of these issues on the cognitive impairment side, just not specific to low health literacy, but uh, we've been going around through, you know, diverse primary care practices to figure out how do you kind of insert it into the workflow? What could you be doing better? Even the comment about um, getting a, a clinic, uh, I'll be very honest, Northwestern has it's been challenging, uh, especially depending on your pair mix to kind of accommodate in the RV, if you're an RVU-based system, a fee-for-service system, um, to think that you can just insert uh, a 30 or 40 minute interview with a patient because of what? Um, similarly, we've been doing a lot of work, um, uh, you know, dealing with how do you extend visits beyond the point of care and allow patients to still report in through you know, various technologies that are working, but we find the bandwidth of bringing back information that patients never filled their medication, bringing back patient discontinued it because of side effects or they're struggling to adhere. Those type of signals, we can do that, but we don't, we're not expanding the bandwidth of the clinic itself to take on this new information. So it's drinking from a fire hose and it's a big challenge. Um, and so uh, I don't, I think there's a, there's a payment issue. There is, uh, but there are clinics that are doing well at this. And we, we just as a quick aside, we have a federally qualified health center um, that is predominantly Medicare, Medicaid. It's all Medicare, Medicaid, and they've made it work. Uh, they have uh, an entirely multi-morbid, complex patient population. They've got services working that we couldn't only dream of at Northwestern. Um, so it's not impossible, but it really is having to kind of figure out who your, who your audience is and how to make it work. Yeah, I think that there are lots of models whereby you can look at who actually can administer a cognitive screen? Could, could, for example, can that be part of the medical assistant's role to be, do a very limited thing that, that at least would then point to uh, maybe, maybe the provider then needs to do a more expanded one? Uh, what are we doing in terms of uh, oftentimes people are, don't come in themselves, but as you say, their son, daughter, spouse come in. What are we doing in terms of handing them a very brief screen on how their loved one is doing um, from a cognitive standpoint? So I think that there are models out there and assessments out there that potentially could be implemented that would then trigger um, subsequent um, further investigation by the provider, but, but systems have to figure this out. Mm -hmm. um, and that all screening does not have to take place at the provider level, which is maybe more cost intensive, that there are some things that can be done um, by well-trained um, ancillary staff. Just a quick follow-up on that. The, the notion that the reason why we're trying to figure out the, the phenotyping a bit is if you know that there is, that it's one in six of your patients or, or one, of, one in nine or 10% that are of greatest risk uh, because of they're, not, they're gonna walk out and they're not gonna be able to follow through with their self-management, that's maybe a, 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 a more palatable dose to swallow in terms of allocating more intensive resources to that group versus if you say it's 50% of your sample. So we've been working through subspecialties and whenever to figure out what would you do if we told you someone missed two doses of their medicine? What would you do if we said that they just stopped it all together? What would, I mean, like, who do you want to view at risk? And that's where we have to partner with the healthcare system. I, I, I would just like to add, I, I, I think we need to step back and maybe do some more of the formative work when it comes to the behavioral illnesses, whether it's addictive disorders or other mental illnesses, that we haven't applied some of the fundamental issues related to health literacy and self-management of care in this field. We've made an assumption that it needs to be externally provided and externally managed. And that's, a, that's an error. So how do we take some of the principles that we're hearing about these elegant examples and, and doing that in a mental health clinic or an addiction clinic or some fully integrated uh, clinic that are caring for these multimorbid patients? What, th there's a lot of room for some of the work that you all might be familiar with from probably 15 or 20 years ago being applied in these different settings. Thank you. This was a wonderful discussion, Bernie. Yes, more than a wonderful discussion. I really appreciate, uh, Steve, your, your moderating it and the panel members. Really excellent discussion. I was just wondering, uh, as we uh, uh, finish this, uh, and we don't need an answer to this right, right now, but what diagnostic categories do we have where reducing cognitive burden actually increases cognition? 
Yeah, where, where, where does that produce results? What diagnostic categories? Where it improves cognition. Yeah. Okay. I don't know as far as diagnosis, but I recently heard Saul Kahn, who developed Saul Kahn Academy, and his belief with kids with teaching is that you have to master a course, and we're not doing that in education. So you can keep looking at his YouTube videos until you have mastered whatever the math is. And, and the, the deal is, I don't think that we're, you know, what he has shown is incredible results with people being able to pass tests and finish school and educate themselves in orphanages in Mongolia and stuff. But we're not applying some of that, y'all are talking about mastery of, of something, but it's like, um, it's different if you're a, a kid mastering algebra and somebody who's saying, I'm not taking this medicine for one reason or another. But it's like we don't, I don't know, what I'm saying is Saul, Saul Khan reduced the burden and figured out how to do that. Now, he was using technology to do it. But I don't know, and he's shown educational results when you reduce yeah. the burden, make it more user friendly. I don't know, yeah. are we finding that out in medicine? Well, I mean, just I think maybe if, if what you're getting at is um, do we have examples where, um, like, uh, that the, the detriment of cognitive impairment or cognitive burden can be alleviated on outcomes by doing certain practices. Yeah. Uh, I think there's, it, it depends on what the outcome is. So I would say that there is a lot that we can do that is kind of in the health literacy evidence base and tool bag that can improve the most proximal outcomes of comprehension. And like, you know, getting at the germane cognitive load, giving people information. There's ways that we can do it, whether it be teach to goal or design principles. We can help people uh, and reduce some of the disparities. I think where you start to see it is you get more distal outcomes. We really haven't, until you start bringing in more external aids, um, which could be technology, which could be a, a loved one or someone that becomes the proxy. I think those are things we're all in, and that's where the process of care and identifying who really do we need to really say you need someone else to kind of be engaged. I mean, we could go off on this, and I know we're past time, but. Well, thank you. We'll, we'll have more conversation about that. Well, thank you once again uh, very much. Uh, we can now break for lunch. <laughs>